The LEED rating system is fundamentally flawed as a measurement and validation tool for green building design. Because it is voluntary, market-driven, and costly to implement, building owners buy into it only to the extent that it proves useful for public relations and marketing purposes. More often, competition compels profit-driven entities to damage environmental and human resources in the process of maximizing the return on their investments. Only governmental regulation, by leveling the playing field for all competitors, can overcome such tendencies. For example, state energy codes promulgated after the first energy crisis of the early 1970s actually reduced energy consumption, while the voluntary LEED project, for all its hype, has had no discernible impact on national energy use. LEED looks at one building at a time, isolated from any larger context, while any rational project to foster sustainable design would seek to tackle the problem at a regional, national, or even international scale. LEED certification has no meaning. Not only are the individual credits that lead to certification often incoherent or inconsistent, but buildings can pick and choose which credits to satisfy, so that, for example, an entire green category of desirable initiatives can be ignored without penalty. Last month, at a memorial service for Dale Corson, Cornell's eighth president, Robert Plain, professor emeritus of chemistry and chemical biology, had this to say, Dale was completely devoted to truth in all that he did. Every action he took reflected his devotion to truth and his strong conviction that a university must be a place for discovering and preserving truth. In contrast to these ideals, Cornell has often promoted its sustainable building initiatives from a marketing or public relations standpoint. Here's an example from an article about the New York City Tech Campus that appeared in the Cornell Chronicle. Quote, the main educational building is being planned to harvest as much energy from the campus site as it consumes. In the parlance of energy experts, it will be net zero energy, end quote. That's how the public relations and marketing people characterize the building. But the truth is considerably different. This first building for the tech campus only reaches that elusive net zero status by taking for itself all the PV and geothermal generated energy, not just from its own building footprint or from its own site area, but from the entire campus, including electricity generated from PV arrays that will eventually rest on top of other campus buildings and energy from geothermal boreholes extending well beyond the building and out over the entire campus. Cornell's decision to submit its building for LEED certification raises similar issues. The LEED system is self-described as voluntary, consensus-based, and market-driven. Using the term market-driven instead of profit-driven is designed to obscure the motivation underlying the continuing exploitation of both environmental and human resources. For example, LEED allocates points for energy efficiency on the basis of cost. If it costs less, it must be more sustainable. The lead commentary states, quote, the intent is to encourage simulations that provide owners value and help them minimize their energy costs, end quote. Of course, the idea of making environmental decisions based on cost rather than on actual environmental impact is what contributed to environmental damage in the first place. The history of energy use and consequent environmental damage from the abuse of timber to coal to oil is set in motion by the same calculation of cost and profitability advocated in the LEED guidelines. I've written a detailed critique of the LEED system and its applicability to Milstein Hall, Cornell's latest LEED Gold project. Here are just a few specific examples from that critique, showing how the LEED system plays games with the truth. The examples cover the five main categories that LEED uses to measure green building design. Milstein Hall gets a point for providing 26 spaces for bicycles, far fewer bicycle spaces than what is actually needed, and Milstein gets another point for alternative transportation, since it added no new parking to the site. Of course, Cornell has recently cut down nearby Redbud Woods, replacing it with a parking lot, and Cornell still hopes to build a parking structure next to Milstein Hall once economic conditions improve sufficiently. But the LEED rating system doesn't care what happens two blocks away or two years into the future. Milstein uses no innovative wastewater technologies, but still gets two points for not using irrigation on its vegetated roof. About that green roof. Avoiding irrigation in Los Angeles may be worthy of recognition, but why should a project be rewarded for such things in our rainy climate? 
and there is nothing particularly sustainable about the roof itself. It has virtually no impact on mitigating stormwater discharge during major storm events, when such mitigation would actually be useful. It does not support biodiversity in any meaningful way. It provides much less insulation than you'd get by installing another layer of rigid polystyrene, and it is less effective at reflecting solar radiation than a light-colored roof membrane would be. Milstein Hall gets another two points by buying low-flow lavatories and toilet fixtures. Of course, with Milstein's toilets two full floors below the large studio level where all the students are, most of the actual water savings from Milstein Hall takes place because students prefer to walk across to adjacent facilities in Sibley and Rand Halls. In Sibley, just because they're the closest, uh, it's on the same floor. Uh, the ones in Milstein are down two floors, so it's sometimes a little far to go down there. Cornell's own projections show that Milstein Hall will only reduce energy consumption by 2% compared with current energy standards, while Cornell's own goals for energy reduction call for 30% or even 50% reductions. But LEED does not measure actual energy consumption, nor does it measure energy reduction in relation to any relevant metric. Instead, it judges energy use by the ratio of the modeled energy cost of the building as designed to the modeled energy cost of the same building built without any special consideration of energy efficiency. In other words, a building that makes no sense can still get lead points for energy efficiency by comparing its energy costs to a stripped down baseline version of the same building that makes even less sense. LEED, in its own guidelines, describes source reduction as being more valuable than recycling, yet it rewards the opposite practice. A project that generates very little construction waste by controlling material use at its source, let's say that only 100 pounds of construction waste is produced, will get no LEED points if 55 pounds of this waste ends up in a landfill, while a project with poor source control 914,000 pounds of waste was produced during Milstein Hall's construction, can get two points by sending 137,000 pounds of waste to the landfill. Contractors were forced to tear down the first version of this reinforced concrete wall in Milstein Hall because one of the superficial horizontal lines created by joints between formwork panels wasn't in the location specified by the architects. In demolishing and replacing the wall, close to 45,000 pounds of recyclable waste were generated, and additional global warming gases were produced, especially for the new cement needed for the replacement wall. And yet, because of this inefficiency, the chances of gaining additional construction waste management points were actually increased, since a greater quantity, and therefore also a greater proportion, of Milstein's construction waste could be recycled. The same perversion of environmental goals shows up in the lead credit for recycled content. In the case of Milstein Hall's steel structure, the extravagance of the design, including enormous cantilever trusses weighing over 1,400 pounds per linear foot, created an enormous amount of post-consumer recycled content, since far more steel was used compared with the amount of steel that one would expect to use in a normally configured building. It turns out that structural steel wide flange elements made largely from junked automobiles contain a great deal of recycled material. In this way, the lead rating system not only tolerates the inefficiency and extravagance of Milstein Hall's steel structure, but actually rewards it under this credit. LEED's checklist approach to sustainability rewards indoor environmental quality in the most puzzling ways. For example, Milstein Hall gains a point for using low-emitting carpets, even though there are virtually no carpets to be found in the entire building. In fact, one needs to go to the bottom level of the auditorium to find this small patch. These examples really represent only the tip of the iceberg. LEED is a successful marketing and branding tool, but it has no place in a research university dedicated to discovery and truth. Cornell should reconsider its decision to buy into this rating system.